What would you do if you knew you were going to die tomorrow? If beyond a shadow of a doubt you know that tomorrow morning at 8.30 you're going to die, what are you going to do today? Spend more time with the people you love? Maybe go on that once-in-a-lifetime trip that you've always wanted to do? Trip? Be like Martin Luther and plant a tree? Right? You all know that? Martin Luther said, if I knew that the world was going to end tomorrow, I would plant a tree today. Because life still goes on, regardless of what's going to happen tomorrow. Right? Here's the next question in this string of questions. What would you do if you knew you were going to die tomorrow? And then the next question is, what would you do if you had been raised from the dead? What if you die at 8.30 tomorrow morning and you rise again at 9 o'clock? I wonder how different Lazarus' life was after Jesus called him out of the tomb. Right? Were his priorities different after Jesus called him out? Did he work less? Did he spend more time with his family and friends? We don't have any clue, according to what the Bible story tells us, about what happened after Lazarus was raised from the dead. But I wonder, what happened? And what would you do if you were raised from the dead? How would your priorities change? Would you work less? And would work be less important to you? Would you treat family and friends differently? Would you worry less about climbing up the corporate ladder and about more time spending with those who you love? There's a lot in our reading this morning from John, but the interesting snippet that caught me this week was the prayer that Jesus prays as He's standing before the tomb of Lazarus. Right? In verses 41 and 42, Jesus says a prayer, but Jesus never asks for any kind of miracle in this prayer. What does Jesus say? He gives thanks to God, that God has always listened to him, and I say these things now so that the people here would know that you are the one who sent me. He doesn't ask God to do anything. He merely thanks God for what's going on. It's kind of like what we'll do a little bit later right here at this table, where I will say the words that Jesus said the night that he was handed over and he gave thanks to God. Right? It's an overhearing. It is a thankful prayer to God, but it's something that we get to hear as overhearing what happened that night as a proclamation of what is going on and who God is and how much God loves each and every one of us. Right? And just before this prayer that Jesus says, I thank you, God, that you listened to me so that everyone would know that you sent me, we hear Martha say to Jesus that Lazarus had been dead for four days, right? The the verse actually says, Lord, we can't move the stone away because there's a stench because he's been in the grave for four days, right? So what does that four days mean? Why, Why four days? Why is four days important? Why did Jesus wait to go to Bethany. Have any of you ever heard the term dead ringer? Anybody? Do you know where it comes from? Do you know where it comes from? Can you explain it to them? And a string on their finger. They would put a bell up above the ground and a string on somebody's finger. So if they woke up and they were buried, they could ring the bell and people would hear it. And you had, if you had a dead ringer, it was somebody who wasn't dead, who had been buried. You see, in Jesus' day, the understanding was that a person could rise from the dead for, within three days' time. If someone was dead, you didn't actually mourn their death until the fourth day because that's when they were actually truly dead because it was possible that they would wake up within three days' time. That's why Jesus waited till the fourth day. See, because they didn't think it was possible for Lazarus to get up out of the tomb and walk out of there because he'd been dead for four days. There's no way that he's going to get up and come out again. But that's why Jesus waited. 
You, know, you see, the purpose of the sign that Jesus does here is not to show the resurrection to new life. It's to show that God had sent Jesus into this world so that people might believe. That's why he said the prayer that he said. That's why he does the things that he do, does here. The main concern of this text is faith. Right? Faith. In who Jesus says that he is, and in the promises that God says that he's going to do for us. Because then Jesus, after he prays these prayers, he cries out, it says in our version. The word there is kratzo in the Greek. It actually means to shout. Right? Jesus shouts out. Lazarus, come out. And only three times is this word used in all of the Gospel of John. One here in verse, chapter 11, verse 43, where Jesus' shout gives new life to a dead man. Another time that they happen is in chapter 12, verse 13, which I would say we'll hear next week, but I don't think we get to hear John next week. I think it's Matthew next week, which is, next week is Palm Sunday, when the people shout Hosanna to David, right? Here comes our king. And the other time that this word is used in the Gospel of John is in chapter 18, verse 40, chapter 19, verses 6, 12, and 15. And these are the verses where the crowd that was shouting Hosanna are now shouting, crucify him. In chapters 18 and 19, the shouts of the people bring death to Christ. Here they bring new life, they're a proclamation of a king, and then they bring death. Right? Jesus' words this morning bring life, not only to Lazarus, but to us. He tells others, after he calls Lazarus out of the tomb, what does he say to the people? He says, unbind him. Why? Because they bound Lazarus up in the cloth, just like they bound Jesus up in cloth. And you couldn't get out of it. They, you know, they bound you pretty tight. So he imagined the mummy walking out of the tomb. And they, Jesus says to the people, unbind him. Let him go. Unbind him and set him free. As if Jesus making him rise from the dead was not setting him free enough, the people around him had to help him free him even more. Because you see, not all of God's works take place supernaturally. Not all of God's work take place supernaturally. Sometimes they require work on our part. The people had to help Lazarus get out of the bindings to set him completely free. Jesus didn't do that. God didn't do that. The people that surrounded Lazarus did that. That's why we need the people that are sitting around us. That's why we need to be here for those people around us because sometimes we're the people that are taking off the bindings. We're the people that are setting others free from the things that hold them captive. We are the people that can be there to help them let go of the things that are holding them back. And that's where our faith completely comes in. Because you see, Lazarus was a dead man lying in a tomb. He could do nothing for himself. All he could do is receive the power that God would give to him. Right? We heard that exact same story in, the, in Ezekiel this morning. I, I, I missed it. And I asked Robert at the, before worship this morning if they were going to sing um, them bones this morning, right? Because in Ezekiel, you'll get the bones that are just laying in the valley and they're just strewn out all over the place. And the voice of the Lord comes and speaks and Ezekiel prophesies and the bones come together and new life is brought into them. But they had to die first before God could give them new life. The call to faith is a call to die to ourselves, to die to what we are, to who we are and to who we think we need to be in order that God can breathe into us the new life that God is going to give to us. So the question that struck me as I looked this week and thought about this text of Lazarus that I've never thought of before is as Jesus stood there in front of the tomb and cried, Lazarus, come out! Did Lazarus have a choice? Could he have stayed in the tomb? Yeah, he probably could have, right? Wouldn't have made for such a good story. But he could have. But he didn't. Because really, when God calls you to go someplace, you really don't have a choice. Trust me. I know. 
he keeps coming after you if he really wants you to do something. So that that question led me to another question. You see, because we talked, the, one of the questions I asked at the beginning was, what would you do if you were raised from the dead? And the question shouldn't be, what would you do if you were raised from the dead? The question is, what are you doing because you have been raised from the dead? You see, each and every one of us, or I'm assuming most of us have, some of us may have not, but most of us have probably gone to something like that thing sitting back there by the door. And you're all probably wondering why it's back there by the door. But that's because that's where we're brought into this community, right? Through that font. What happens at that font is we die to ourselves and are claimed as God's children. So it's not if you had raised from the dead, it's since you have been raised from the dead, why are you doing the things that you're doing and how are you living your life? Right? Because we died in that baptism. We die in our daily repentance. And God raises us each and every time to a new life. But sometimes I wonder in that raising if we're not like Lazarus in a moment of hesitation as he hears Jesus calling his name and waking up from a deep sleep and going, you know, I'm kind of comfortable right here. I don't think I want to move. I like these cloths tied around my body and I like the way that things are and I just want to keep myself wrapped up and bound in these grave clothes reminding me of everything that I've had in my old life because what is out there scares me. Right? And we try to keep ourselves bound up by holding on to the things of our past life and not allowing Jesus in and being what He needs to be in our lives and taking full control. We bound ourselves up. We hold ourselves captive. By holding on to those things from the past, we're not allowing Jesus to come in and free us and forgive us. Do you know what? Jesus has freed us and Jesus has forgave us. It's just us holding our own selves captives because we can't see the grace and mercy that God has already given to us. If we keep holding on to the things of our old lives, we're not allowing the freedom that God has given us to take place and hold in our lives. When we keep punishing ourselves for the mistakes and sins that we've made, we are placing ourselves over and above God because God has forgiven us. And if we can't forgive ourselves, then we're saying we have more power than the one that created us. We need to let go and allow the freedom that God has given us to take hold in our lives. Because you see, each and every one of us truly has life after death. Because you have been given a new life. When Jesus and God and the Holy Spirit named you and claimed you in the waters of your baptism, you died to your old self and rose again to what God has given you in the life that only He could give you. You died as the old person and rose to the new creation that is in Christ. And don't let the bindings of your old dead self keep you in a place where God doesn't want you to be. So live into the life that God has given to Lazarus and to each and every one of you. So the question I leave you with this morning is, since God has raised you from the dead, how are you going to go and live for Him? 